More often than not, a time comes when our calling to public service has us speaking up for those disadvantaged and against those who would choose to misdirect the good use of power. Senator Elizabeth Warren recently held one of her many town hall meetings in Quincy, where she invited questions from the audience. She's running for a second term as United States Senator from Massachusetts. She's opposed by the GOP-endorsed candidate Jeff Deal. What is the message that Senator Warren hopes to communicate that will secure and protect her seat for another term? Hello, I'm Joe Collymore, and welcome to a special edition of Close Ups Campaign 2018. My special guest today is United States Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts. Welcome, Senator Warren. Thank you, Joe. I'm glad to be here. We're going to talk about the economy first. Okay, good. And today actually marks the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers yeah. and the start of the worst financial meltdown since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Last Thursday, you said the only way to avoid another imminent crisis is to break up the Wall Street banks mm -hmm. that caused it and hold the bank executives accountable. Iceland prosecuted its bank yes, executives. It In fact, it might have been the only country mm -hmm. so far. Is it too late for us to do the same? Yeah, it probably is over the crash of 2008, but it's never too late to pass laws that require real accountability. You catch a kid with drugs in his pocket, and I'm telling you, there's a chance he's headed off to jail, right? A banker who helps launder money for the drug companies uh, has uh, 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 participated in getting those drugs out there through the financial end of it. No personal responsibility at all. My view is, Anybody who breaks the law ought to have the risk of personal liability. And so I have a bill that I've proposed that's a, a nobody is too big for jail. Um, when you break the laws on fraud, you know, when you break the laws on uh, uh, the financial regulations, it shouldn't just be that the financial institution pays a fine. Because the problem with that is that doesn't come out of the decision makers hide, the, the, the executives. That just becomes a cost of doing business. And they say, you know, make a lot of profits breaking the law. Maybe we get caught. Maybe we pay a little fine. I really think you get real change when the executives look at that and say, this could cost me money and could actually mean that that executive ends up in handcuffs. 
You also cite the ongoing issue of inequality for women in the workplace. Yeah. So we're staying on the economy for a minute. Mm -hmm. A recent cover story in Time magazine highlighted a Kentucky teacher with a master's degree working three jobs and selling her blood plasma yeah. just to make a living? Yeah. She did everything right. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, what's wrong with this picture? And you know, here's the part that gets me, Joe, the, the, the short version of this. 1935 to about 1980, GDP goes up. And what happens? Workers' pay goes up, adjusted for inflation. And that's true for the 90% of America, not just the top. It's the upper middle class, the middle class, the working class, the working poor, and the poor poor. Everybody does better. That productivity, that increase in profits, mm -hmm. workers are getting a big share of it. About 1980, it starts to shift, and you just watch. Wages flatten out as profits keep going up, and the gap keeps getting wider and wider. What we have now is a Washington, a set of regulations, a set of tax laws, a set of rules that inch at a time have helped the wealthy and the well-connected do better and better while it leaves everyone else behind. This is for me, you know this was my work long before I ever got involved in politics. This is for me the heart of what drew me into running for office and then what I fight for down in Washington, just to try to level that playing field just a little. The consumer agency that I helped build is there just to have one player in the game that's all about a level playing field and has, this is gonna shock you, big banks should not be able to cheat people on mortgages and credit cards and student loans and payday loans, that sort of thing. You can't believe what a fight that is. But it is a reminder of how badly broken Washington is. Let's switch gears and talk about energy. Yep. You've gone on record as opposing the proposed compressor station in Weymouth. I have. And as you know, Spectra Energy, now known as Enbridge, plans to build a 7,700 horsepower fracked gas compressor station in the Four River Basin. Mm -hmm which many say is adversely going to affect our South Shore citizens. Mm -hmm. And apparently the majority of the people in this area are opposed to mm -hmm. this fracking facility. However, why is it so complicated a process to change? And what are your thoughts and ideas on how to address this? So, you know, I'm on record opposing it, and I've actually been there. And I've met with the people who are leading uh, the fight against that Weymouth compressor station and done everything I can to support him. This is what really gets to me. This really goes to what we were just talking about. And that is who does government work for? Right now in the Trump administration with the regulatory commissions, the whole idea is how to make industry more profitable. And if they can be more profitable, putting in a compressor station, it seems to be the view of the regulators to heck with the people who live there, to heck with the people whose homes uh, value will be affected, to heck with the people whose children go to school nearby and God forbid there's an accident who would be injured by this, to heck with all of them. I think that is fundamentally backwards. Our regulatory agencies are supposed to be there for the people. They're supposed to listen to the local communities. I'm gonna stay in this fight, but I'll tell you, a big part of this fight is gonna be about making real change in Washington. And that's what we need to do in 2018. As you know, we had um, a tragedy this past week mm -hmm. over in the Andover Lawrence yep. area involving uh, gas lines that were erupting across close to about 100 homes. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to talk about is Massachusetts, as I understand it, was the only state to date in the Union that allowed for, permitted the offloading of natural gas from the Siberian Russian Arctic mm -hmm. um, enterprise. 
with this approaching winter, and of course, you know, we need our energy sources in order to stay warm, what's the alternative to bringing in natural gas, especially from the Russian no, Arctic Reserve? Look, this is the problem we always have. Mm -hmm. When politicians don't want to make the long-term investments, because after all, a lot of them won't be there by the time those investments pay off, right? And everyone stays in the short term. What can we do in the short term? And I realize everybody has to eat in the short term. Everybody has to keep their homes warm in the short term. I, I understand that. But for me, this is about how much we patch together in the short term. And I know it's a lot of patching from here and there. And it depends on how severe the winter is, uh, depends on how much we can stockpile of different uh, energy sources, how much we can bring in. But this underscores for me the importance of our having long-term sustainable energy. You know, here in Massachusetts, I, I don't have to remind you, we're not energy producers. Um, we need to make those investments in green energy long-term, and we need to do it as a country, but it will be particularly helpful for us in Massachusetts. Uh, I, don't, I don't have to talk to the folks in New Bedford about the importance, for example, of offshore wind. Uh, what more we can do with hydropower, what more we can do with solar power, what we can do to upgrade our grid for storage so that we can use clean energy, have it available when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, all of those pieces. But here, where we are right now, we glance over to that ocean and think about what rising ocean levels mean for the way of life that's been built up and down this coast. What it means uh, if the oceans rise and the storms keep getting worse. This is no longer a matter of choice. Do we want to try to reduce carbon emissions? This is a matter of urgency. We need to reduce those emissions here in Massachusetts. We need to do it throughout the United States. We need to be leaders to do it all around the world. Climate change is real. I believe in science. Yes. And I believe we got to do everything we can to try to bring down our carbon footprint and protect this earth. We only got the one. One quick last question. Sure. Let's talk about immigration uh -huh. real quickly here. Your opponent, Jeff Deal, has gone on record as a self-described fiscal conservative, and he believes in the need to invest in the wall. Mm -hmm. Conversely, a recent New York Times article piece stated that the new immigrants are more likely to come from Asia than from Latin America, mm -hmm. and that was borne out recently in the Census Bureau stats. Mm -hmm. That's quite a contrast. Yes, it is. So what is your position as it regards the wall, and what is your position in terms of the long-term view of immigration reform? So I'm opposed to the wall. I think the wall is both hateful and ineffective. Can we just get both halves? Just a lose-lose for America. I believe we need comprehensive immigration reform. And my first year in the Senate, when I first went there, we had a bipartisan deal. Republicans and Democrats who'd gotten together and said, okay, we'll make some changes. We'll increase border security. That's part of the deal. That's, that's what the Republicans wanted. But we're going to get a path for everyone, the people who are already here, and a more rational way to decide who gets to come and how, how these opportunities are made available to different folks. We talked about the importance of keeping families together. We had a bipartisan deal and couldn't get it through the House. The Republicans absolutely would not even bring it up for a vote. So I'm going to do politics for you again here okay. at the end. And that is, um, we got this election in 2018. And I understand, even after the election, Donald Trump will still be in the White House. But the difference between having Democrats in charge of the House and in charge of the Senate would be whether or not we can push toward comprehensive immigration reform. We've already demonstrated we can do this in a bipartisan way in the Senate. We can force a vote if Democrats are in charge. We take back control of the House. Then I think we've got a real shot at, at trying to make something that reflects both 
what's good economically mm -hmm. for this country, but also what's in line with our values. And, and I think that's critical for our laws. Senator Warren, there's so much more that I'd love to discuss with you. And I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but other than to just say, I'd love to have you back on close-ups after the election's done so we can have a deeper conversation. I'd love that. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And that wraps up our special edition of Close-Ups. Join us next time.